my god, it's just mimics. Oh, mimics all the way down. Oh, hi there. Welcome to Back to Basics. Welcome to whatever this show will end up being called. I'm here to teach you a little bit about how to play D&D. If you've never played before, if you just want to refresh around the basics, or if you just want to throw this video at a friend so you don't have to explain it to them, uh, that's what this is for. I'm just going to be explaining some really basics, basic basics. I'm going to explain some basic basics of D&D uh, for your viewing pleasure. How the fuck did I say it like that? I am Dungeon Master, your guide in the realm of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Let's get back to the reason that we're really here. Without much further ado, I give you... First episode of Crow's School for how to DM good and do other stuff good too. So... You want to check out this D&D thing. It seems to be pretty cool, pretty popular these days, and, well, you want to check it out for yourself. So you run out and buy a little player's handbook, and, well, you find out pretty quickly that you're going to need a DM, and you don't know any DMs, so I guess the job falls to you. So you run out and buy... Oh, wrong book. You run out and buy <laughs> your Dungeon Master's Guide, and you're like, okay, cool, now we're in business, but... If I'm gonna be the dungeon master, I'm gonna need that monster manual for all those cool monsters. And then, pretty quickly, you discover that you got a whole lot of rule books. Oh, bitch, all these rules! So the good news is, you don't need to read all those rule books from cover to cover. You don't even need to read one of those rule books from cover to cover. There's actually a reduced version of the rules that not a lot of people seem to know about. Uh, it's called the basic rule set and it is available online for free so if you don't have the money to front for like three I don't know what they run for now like 30 to 40 dollar books you know that's easy 120 bucks you don't have to pay that you don't have to read it all but that basic basic rule set is still 180 pages long so I thought I would take things a step further and simplify them even more and make it easy for anybody to understand without having to sit down with basically what amounts to a textbook to figure out, you know, how to play the game. Because how to play the game really isn't that complicated. I think anybody and everybody can play the game. It can seem a little bit intimidating at first, but I promise you, once you get into things, it will all become really clear. Once you understand like what some of these terms mean and where some of these numbers are coming from and like what they actually represent, it all starts clicking and it all starts making sense and it won't feel intimidating at all. Like it's like riding a bike, you know, it can be a little scary at first, but once once you learn it, it's you know, it's like second nature, really. It you you you'll be surprised. We're just going to cover super basic stuff. We're going to talk a lot about dice rolling mainly. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, what's a modifier? What is initiative? What is armor class? You know, what is a saving throw? And what is a skill check? What's a dexterity check? Like that's the kind of stuff we're going to be talking about. So if you've played a lot of D&D before, uh, if you've run D&D before, this is probably going to be <laughs> very, very basic for you. But that's okay. You know, there's nothing wrong with going over the basics again. And maybe I can help explain it in a way that will help you explain it to somebody else in the future. So if you want to stick around for that, and I'm going to be, that's what I'm going to be doing. So the D20. The D20 is sort of the iconic D&D dice. It's called a D20 because it is a 20-sided dice. There, That's the terminology, so you see it in the book. You know, a D6 is a six-sided dice that you might be familiar with. There's also a D4, a D8, a D10, a D12, and of course the D20. So the D20 is important because it sort of determines if things happen. If an attack lands, if you succeed a, a skill check, or a saving throw. The d20 is sort of like the dice that says, does this thing happen, yes or no? But it really adds to the drama. Will I trip on a flagstone or leap heroically into battle? Let's find out. Right? And all the other dice are pretty much just there to tell you how much something happens. How much damage you do is 
the main thing those dice are used for. The other main thing that those dice are used for is random effects. So if a spell has a random effect or if there's a random encounter, sometimes you'll roll on, usually on a table or in the spell description, it'll say, roll a, let's say a D8. Roll a D8 and there'll be a table one to eight of different things that could possibly happen. So that's the other main use of dice, but the like 90% of the time, the D20 is gonna tell you, does this thing happen, yes or no? And the other dice are gonna tell you how much damage is dealt when that thing happens. The other important thing to understand are modifiers, which is something we might dig into a little bit more once uh, we start talking about character creation. But for now, just understand that a modifier is something you add to your dice roll or subtract. So it modifies your dice roll, hence the name. So if I'm a very strong, if I am a barbarian, I'm, you know, quite, quite hardy, quite strong. I have high strength. I have high constitution. I would probably be adding numbers whenever I did anything that relates to strength or constitution, but maybe I'm not that smart. You know, the stereotypical barbarian's a bit dumb. Um, so if I had to do something relating to intelligence or research or anything in that genre uh, of ability checks, or saving throws, I would have probably a negative modifier. Not necessarily, you can build different types of barbarians, you can put stats in different numbers, but stereotypically that barbarian would be very strong, probably dumb, so. Okay, so I'm gonna run you through a little example to show you kind of what this looks like in practice, and I'm gonna try and show you the different types of rolls that you would make using a d20. So in this case, this is my wizard character right here, and this stick of gum is gonna represent a door, right? So my wizard is sneaking through a dungeon or something like that. They come up to a door and they try, they're gonna try and lock pick it. So I rolled a nine, which isn't great, but let's say that maybe I have the criminal background, so I'm proficient in that, and maybe I have a little bit of dex. So let's say I have a plus one in dex and a plus two proficiency bonus from my criminal past. I might add three to that roll and end up with a 12. So, okay, maybe it's not a very secure door, and let's just say for the sake of argument that a 12 gets me through this door, and I manage to lock pick it. Door is gone, but oh no, on the other side of the door, is this Noel Chieftain. <laughs> so at this point, we're just gonna say combat starts without any of that, you know, dialogue bogging us down. But let's say combat starts here. So we're gonna roll a d20 for my character. So I rolled a 17 for my wizard, plus one initiative bonus. Uh, so initiative is based on your dex score. My dex is 12, so I get a plus one. Again, <laughs> try not to get bogged down in where I'm getting all these numbers from. I'll dig into that a bit more when we come to character creation, but just know that I have a plus one to initiative thanks to my dex score. So my 17 becomes an 18. I'm gonna roll initiative for the Noel Chieftain. The Noel Chieftain gets a 10, and let's say he's not very dexterous. Let's say he's completely average, so he has a 10 in dexterity. So he has a modifier of zero, meaning I don't add or subtract anything to the roll. So my Null Chieftain has an initiative of 10. My wizard has an initiative of 18 for this particular combat encounter. So the wizard goes first and the Null Chieftain goes second. Now, that doesn't matter that much when we're talking about two people in battle, but if you're talking about an encounter with 20, 30 people in it, it becomes very important to know who's attacking in what order. But for now, we know who gets the jump. The wizard is going to attack first. So for the wizard's turn, he's going to immediately reflexively toss a fireball at the Noel Chieftain here. And fireball works a little bit differently from normal attacks. Um, it's not it's an area of effect. So the whole area is engulfed in a fireball. So it's not so much a question of whether or not it hits, it's more a question of how hard it hits. So the Null Chieftain here is going to have to make a dexterity saving throw to try and reduce the amount of damage the fireball does to half. So first things that's gonna happen is the Null Chieftain is gonna roll that dexterity saving throw. Okay. So the fireball goes off. I rolled all its 8d6 damage, which is quite a lot, uh, but the damage is cut in half because the Null Chieftain made his saving throw. So I rolled the damage uh, off camera because I don't have eight dice. 
Um, so I added all that up and it came out uh, to 29 damage. You cut 29 damage in half, you get 14 and a half. And in D&D, you always round down. So that becomes 14 damage to our Noel Chieftain. Our Noel Chieftain is hurt, but he's still okay. So that's the end of our wizard's turn. And now our Noel Chieftain's turn comes up. So our Noel Chieftain is going to move into melee range and make an attack with one of his axes. In fact, let's say he's going to... Let's keep it simple and say he's just going to attack with one axe. <laughs> keep it to a single attack. So our Noel Chieftain attacks and he rolls a four, which is really quite low. Um, but with that profic with the proficiency bonus, I'm not sure what the Noel's attack bonus would be, but let's just say for the sake of argument, it's plus five. So that brings us to nine. All right, so nine uh, against the wizard's AC or armor class. Now. The wizard's armor class is quite low. It's only, uh, you know, it, let's say it's only 12 in this example. Again, I'm just sort of making up numbers that feel right. I'm not, I don't actually have character sheets ready for these, for this example, but okay. So the Noel Chieftain's going to attack. He only rolled a nine against the wizard's armor class of 12, which is quite low as far as armor class goes, but the Noel Chieftain rolled quite low. So that's going to be a miss. But let's say that the Noel Chieftain has, you know, multi-attack, which a lot of monsters do. Let's have him do another attack, just so I can show you what happens on a successful attack. Noel Chieftain rolls again. That's a 16 plus 5. That's a 21. That is definitely going to be a hit. 21 is probably would hit most things. So uh, let's say that the Noel Chieftain's hand axe does... Oh, I don't know. Let's say... Well, let's say 1d6 damage plus strength. So three, I roll the three and I'm gonna add his strength to his attack roll. So whatever that would be, let's say another three. So that would be six damage to the wizard and that's gonna end our combat example. Both, <laughs> both of our contestants are alive, but the uh, Noel Chieftain is hurting quite badly when our wizard, who doesn't have a lot of health, isn't doing great either but his turn's coming up next, and I'm sure he has a nasty surprise ready and waiting. Okay, and with that example, we've seen pretty much every kind of roll you're gonna see in D&D. We saw a dexterity check to lockpick the door. We saw initiative rolls when combat started to determine who went first. We saw the Noel Chieftain make a dexterity saving throw to reduce the fireball damage by half. Uh, we saw a attack roll come out from the Noel Chieftain, and we saw that miss, what that looks like. We saw it hit, what that looks like, and the damage roll that comes after a successful hit. Um, the only thing we didn't cover were uh, skill checks. So skills basically work under the same principle. So real quick, in case you're confused about the differences between some of these types of checks, a ability check is just your ability score your straight the modifier that is derived from your ability score um, we'll get into exactly how that number comes from that other number uh, in a character creation video later but for now just understand that the mo it's just a straight modifier if it's a dexterity check it's just what your dex modifier is if it's an intelligence check it's just what your intelligence check is now saving throws take that modifier that the weird that you get from the ability checks but saving throws you can be proficient in depending on what your class is so certain classes are just automatically proficient in certain types of saving throws so like a cleric is proficient in wisdom saving throws um so like mental effects they're particularly resistant to because not only do they add their wisdom modifier but they also add their proficiency bonus which scales as you level so that'll get higher over time as you become higher and higher level. Uh, skills, almost exactly the same as saving throws. The only difference is your saving throws are just automatic. They come with your class. So cleric's always gonna have wisdom, but a cleric might have different sets of skills depending on what the player chooses. Um, there's a certain skills listed on your class and you can choose from among those. And you also it also gets affected by your background. So if you're a cleric who used to be a criminal, you might have some criminal skills uh, as well as more typical cleric skills. Um, so skills, you also get to add your proficiency bonus if you have that proficiency 
except the only difference is you get to choose what those skills are. Okay, so I think we're gonna leave skills aside for right now because they're so tied into what class you choose and what background you choose for your character. I think we're gonna leave those for the character creation video, but for now, just understand that you understand the gist of how they work. Um, it's basically just your uh, ability modifier, and if you're proficient in the skill, you also add your proficiency. Sometimes there are ways you can make that number go even higher. Like for example, the rogue gets a ability called expertise, which lets you double your proficiency bonus. So you can get skill, you can get your skill numbers, uh, your skill modifiers uh, quite high. Um, but we're not gonna get into that, just so you understand the fundamentals of how skills kind of work in general. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit, we're gonna talk very briefly about advantage and disadvantage. You'll see this all over the place in D&D 5th uh, edition. The whole idea is that every time you're rolling a D20, it is possible for various reasons. You know, maybe uh, you're sneak attacking somebody and that can grant you advantage because they don't know where the attack is coming from. Say you pop out of a barrel and stab someone. Um, or whatever, whatever you might be doing for circumstantial reasons, for reasons that have something to do with a special ability, you can end up getting advantage. And advantage means simply this, instead of rolling a single D20 like normal, you roll two D20s and you take the higher of the two numbers. So I'm gonna roll these two D20s here and I got a seven and a 17. So I would use the 17 and just discard the seven. Disadvantage, works the opposite way. So if I had disadvantage for some reason, say, I don't know, I was recently concussed or uh, I had spent the entire night before drinking and got completely uh, trashed and I'm hung over for the next combat encounter, I have disadvantage on, let's say, attack rolls, then I would have disadvantage and I would be forced to roll two dice and take the lower of the two numbers. So in that example, I would have had to take the seven instead of the 17. So as you can see, <laughs> From that example, I mean, it's random, but from that example, the difference between advantage and disadvantage could be huge, right? So the uh, other important footnote with advantage and disadvantage is if you have advantage and disadvantage at the same time, they cancel each other out and you just roll normally. If you have, for some reason, you cannot get double advantage, you cannot get double disadvantage, but if you have two reasons that you have advantage and one reason that you have disadvantage, the advantage and disadvantage cancel each other out and you're left with advantage still. So, and same thing works the other way around. Obviously two disadvantages, one advantage, two cancel each other out. You're left with a single disadvantage. So same principle works in both directions and that about covers it for advantage. It's really quite simple. Uh, just to reiterate, advantage can be granted by your DM for very circumstantial reasons. Like there's no rule saying that if you spend the night drinking and you know wake up with a hangover, you would have disadvantage. That's something your DM would decide uh, or not decide depending on <laughs> their mood, I guess. Um, but there are mechanical things that grant you advantage. There are certain abilities that say specifically, this gets you advantage when you do this ability. Okay, we're also gonna cover real quick the three main types of actions that are the actions you can do in combat. Now, when you're not in combat, things are a little bit more free flowing, but when combat starts, the rules become very rigid and you're basically restricted to these three types of actions. So the three actions are your regular action, which can cover things like attacking or casting a spell. And we also have your movement, which is pretty self-explanatory. You have a certain movement in feet and each square is five feet. So if you have 30 feet of movement, you divide that by five, that's uh, six squares of movement, right? So that's pretty straightforward movement and actions. But then there's bonus actions, which is a little bit more opaque. So bonus actions are basically minor things you can do in addition to your action. So they tend to be things that are done very quickly or things that don't require a lot of time and the abilities that you have will specify 
if they are can be done as an action or as a bonus action. Now, importantly, these are not interchangeable. You cannot take two bonus actions. You cannot forego your action and take two bonus actions instead. They are non-interchangeable. No <laughs> exchanges, no refunds, no. No substitutions, exchanges, or refunds. <laughs> you get one action, you get one bonus action, and you get movement, and you cannot, you cannot mix and match, right? So generally in combat, you want to try and use both your action and your bonus action because when your turn ends, that's it. Those those actions are gone, right? So try and take up as much, try and do as much in your turn as you can. If your class has ac access to bonus actions, you should probably be making use of those as much as you can. There are, of course, other types of actions, things like disengaging, which is when you move away from somebody without provoking an opportunity attack and an opportunity attack is real simply if you move out of somebody's threat radius uh in melee range they can attack you as you try and make your escape so a disengage is when you use your action not offensively but defensively to get away from them without them being able to make that opportunity attack against you now the dodge action is sort of like similarly, it's very defensive. It's basically you focusing entirely on defense and trying not to get hit. So there, there's other types of actions, but like 90% of the time, you're probably gonna be using your action to attack or cast a spell. Now, I'm not, not saying you should only do those things. I'm just saying that's most of what you're gonna be doing with an action. And bonus actions, on the other hand, are very, very class dependent. So certain classes can use their bonus action to attack after they use their action to attack. They can get a quick attack in with their bonus action. Some classes have access to bonus action spells, such as the cleric's uh, healing word, I believe, is a bonus action. So you can cast that uh, to get in, you know, a very quick heal on somebody. Um, so it's very class dependent. The Hunter's Mark, which is a ranger ability you can use to get some extra damage on a particular target and track the target if, uh, if they flee, I believe as well. Um, so those are all examples of bonus actions. Like I said, bonus actions are super class dependent. So it's hard to list all the different things that can be done with a bonus action. Your class will tell you what your bonus actions are. So read your class description and it's it's pretty it, it tells you it's pretty self-explanatory i should mention that you don't have to use your bonus action every turn i just recommend that you do you don't even have to use your your movement or your action really you can choose to not do anything on your turn um generally don't recommend doing that but you can you now it's up to you if you just want to use your action you want to save your bonus action and not use it because i don't know you're saving the you want to save the spell for later or something like that totally valid it's totally fine to not use these actions but I'm just saying, in general, I recommend trying to use your action and your bonus action, and maybe even your movement as much as you can. Uh, movement's a little more complicated because you can be punished if you try and move out of melee range with somebody or move through somebody to get somewhere else. They can, they can get these extra opportunity attacks as you move through their space or as you move out of their space. So just watch out for that movement you know, maybe not as true as the other two. So that's about it for actions. I think I will leave it at that. Maybe we will cover more in-depth combat actions. And I'll, maybe I'll get into the specifics of all the different types of actions you can take in combat and more examples of bonus actions and the synergies you can get between an action and a bonus action. More combat, I mean, more combat, <laughs> more combat focused in future combat video, perhaps. Real quick, I wanted to uh, address something that I sort of let fall by the wayside a little bit. Um, I didn't really talk about what armor class is or like where that number comes from. I didn't really talk about, you know, how you know what a spell save number is. Uh, and I don't think I talked at all about difficulty classes, but they're all kind of the same thing. They're all the number you need to beat to succeed at whatever you're trying to do. So difficulty Difficulty class is usually the number you need to roll higher on a skill check. Armor class is the number you need to roll higher than on an attack roll. And a spell save is the number you need to roll higher than to resist or uh, diminish the effects of a spell that you are being targeted by or, or in the radius of. Uh, so they're all the same idea. They're all just the target numbers that you need to uh, beat to succeed against. 
Uh, so in terms of, you know, in terms of an attack that would be succeeding would be hitting, right? I guess it depends, it depends which side of that you're on for it to be a success, right? But yeah, the idea is the attack is a success if it's a higher number. The skill check is a success if it's a higher number. Now, where do those difficulty classes, armor classes, where do those come from? There's formulas for those. So armor class is probably the most simple. Uh, armor class is usually it's it's 10. 10 is flat, like no nothing. Naked guy has 10 armor, right? Seems a little strange, but it, it, it makes sense. Uh, so naked guy is, is 10 AC. Uh, if you roll higher than a 10, you get you hit him, right? But he also gets to add his dexterity modifier. So let's say he's really nimble. He has like 18 dex. That would be a four modifier. So plus four to, to his 10 AC, he would have 14 AC. Uh, maybe he puts on some armor. That would also make his armor go up by a certain amount. If you look up D&D uh, &D armor, it'll tell you exactly what AC you would have while wearing it. And importantly, it'll also tell you what the limit on your dexterity modifier is. If you're wearing like heavier armor, sometimes you get a limited dexterity modifier or no dexterity modifier for like heavy plate armor. So if you look at all the armor values, it'll tell you exactly what AC you get for what kind of armor. And if you're not wearing armor, it's just your dexterity bonus to your armor class. So pretty easy. Uh, spell save modifiers are a little more complicated. There, there's a formula for it. It's eight plus your proficiency bonus plus the relevant spell casting modifier. So different spell casters use different ability scores, um, but whatever, you'll know what it is. The, <laughs> the game will tell you, you know, if you're using intelligence or wisdom or charisma as your main spell focus stat. So that modifier goes in there along with your proficiency bonus for your total spell save. And enemies, it, enemies and traps and things, it'll usually tell you what the spell save DC is. Um, that just leaves us with uh, difficulty class. Difficulty class is for skill checks. So usually that if it's a pre-written module, uh, like a pre-written adventure, the book will tell you if they roll higher than a DC difficulty class 15, then they, in their on their perception check, they spot this. If they roll higher than their, than like, 18 on their investigation check they find out this piece of information or they're able to pickpocket this guy's keys if they roll higher than this so so difficulty class is all about skills and the uh if it's not a pre-written adventure then it's something that your your dungeon master just makes up a lot of times dc checks are something that your dungeon master makes up on the fly they're you know you tell them what you want to do and they'll think well sure yeah okay you can do that and in their head, they're, they're not going to tell you, but in their head, they might think, yeah, if you can roll higher than a 15, then yeah, yeah, you can pull that off. Anyway, I think that about covers everything I want to cover. I think we've done a really good job of uh, covering all the bases, all the basics. I think you're probably ready to go at this point. I still would recommend reading your class description to know what your abilities do. Even if you're starting at level one, you have a couple of a uh, couple of things you can do that it worth reading at least that far. Um, I would recommend maybe also taking a quick look at the uh, basic rule set, uh, which I will link below to that free PDF that explains in way more detail than I went into all the basic rules. Um, but yeah, at, at this point, I would say you're, you're good to go. In 30 minutes or less, I taught you probably 90% of the rules of D&D. Um, there's a lot of things that happen outside those rules you know there's 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 optional rules there's there's homebrew rules but in terms of like strict fundamentals you are 90 percent, maybe even 95 percent good to go just based on this video i really do believe that you can pick up and play and it will all start to make sense as you go it's definitely one of those things that uh it is best learned by doing not by reading the book or by having someone explain it to you. Uh, so get out there and give it a try. And if you're brave enough, uh, give DMing a shot because it's uh, a lot easier than you might think and a lot more fun too. So highly recommend you try that. And hopefully I will be back with some more D&D related content real soon. So 
Thanks for watching. Be seeing you. Whoa.